Excerpt from On the Ultimate Origin of Things by Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, to 1716, published in 1697. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Excerpt from On the Ultimate Origin of Things in addition to the world or aggregate of finite things there is some unique being who governs not only like the soul in me or rather like the ego itself in my body but in a much higher sense for one being dominating the universe not only rules the world but he creates and fashions it is superior to the world and so to speak extra mundane and by this very fact is the ultimate reason of things. For the sufficient reason of existence cannot be found either in any particular thing or in the whole aggregate or series. Suppose a book on the elements of geometry to have been eternal and that others had been successively copied after it. It is evident that, although we might account for the present book by the book which was its model, we could nevertheless never, by assuming any number of books whatever, reach a perfect reason for them. For we may always wonder why such books have existed from all time, that is, why books are at all, and why they are thus written. What is true of books is also true of the different states of the world. For in spite of certain laws of transformation, a succeeding state is in a certain way only a copy of the preceding. And to whatever interior state you may go back, you will never find there a perfect reason why, forsooth, there is any world at all, and such a world as exists. And even if you imagine the world eternal, nevertheless, since you posit nothing but a succession of states, and as you find a sufficient reason for them in none of them whatsoever, and as any number of them whatever does not aid you in giving a reason for them, it is evident that the reason must be sought elsewhere. For in eternal things, even where there is no cause, there must be a reason which, in perduring things, is necessity itself or essence. But in the series of changing things, if it were supposed that they succeeded each other eternally, this reason would be, as will soon be seen, the prevailing of inclinations where the reasons are not necessitating, i.e., of an absolute or metaphysical necessity the opposite of which would imply contradiction, but inclining, from which it follows that by supposing the eternity of the world an ultimate extra-mundane reason of things, or God, cannot be escaped. The reasons of the world, therefore, lie hidden in something extra-mundane, different from the chain of states or series of things, the aggregate of which constitutes the world. We must, therefore, pass from physical or hypothetical necessity, which determines the posterior states of the world by the prior, to something which is of absolute or metaphysical necessity, the reason for which cannot be given. For the present world is necessary, physically or hypothetically, but not absolutely or metaphysically. It being granted, indeed, that the world, such as it is, is to be, it follows that things must happen in it, just as they do. But as the ultimate origin must be in something which is metaphysically necessary, and as the reason of the existing can only be from the existing, there must exist some one being metaphysically necessary, or whose essence is existence, and thus there exists something which differs from the plurality of beings, or from the world, which, as we have recognized and shown, is not metaphysically necessary. But in order to explain a little more clearly how, from eternal or essential or metaphysical truths, 
temporary, contingent, or physical truths arise, we ought first to recognize that from the very fact that something exists rather than nothing, there is in possible things, that is, in the very possibility or essence, a certain need of existence, and, so to speak, some claim to existence. In a word, that essence tends of itself towards existence. Whence it further follows that all possible things, whether expressing essence or possible reality, tend by equal right toward existence, according to their quantity of essence or reality, or according to the degree of perfection which they contain. For perfection is nothing else than quantity of essence. Hence, it is most clearly understood that among the infinite combinations of possibles and possible series, that one actually exists by which the most of essence or of possibility is brought into existence. And indeed, there is always in things a principle of determination, which is to be taken from the greatest and the smallest, or in such a way that the greatest effect is obtained with the least, so to speak, expenditure. And here the time, place, or in a word, the receptivity or capacity of the world may be considered as the expenditure or the ground upon which the world can be most easily built, whereas the varieties of forms correspond to the commodiousness of the edifice and the multiplicity and elegance of its chambers and the matter itself may be compared to certain games where all the spaces on a table are to be filled according to determined laws, and where unless a certain skill be employed, you will be finally excluded by unfavorable spaces, and forced to leave many more places empty than you intended or wished. But there is a certain way of filling most easily the most space. Just as, therefore, if we have to make a triangle, there being no other determining reason, it follows that an equilateral results. And if we have to go from one point to another without any further determination as to the way, the easiest and shortest path will be chosen. So it being once posited that being is better than not being, or that there is a reason why something should be rather than nothing, or that we must pass from the possible to the actual, it follows that even if nothing further is determined, the quantity of existence must be as great as possible, regard being had to the capacity of the time and of the place, or to the possible order of existence, exactly as tiles are disposed in a given area in such a way that it shall contain the greatest number of them possible. From this it is now marvelously understood how in the very origin of things a sort of divine mathematics or metaphysical mechanics was employed, and how the determination of the greatest quantity of existence takes place. It is thus that from all angles the determined angle in geometry is the right angle, and that liquids placed in heterogeneous positions take that form which has the most capacity, or the spherical. But especially it is thus that in ordinary mechanics itself, when several heavy bodies act upon each other, the motion which results constitutes, on the whole, the greatest descent. For just as all possibles tend by equal right to exist in proportion to their reality, so all weights tend by equal right to descend in proportion to their gravity. And as here a motion is produced which contains the greatest possible descent of heavy bodies, so there a world is produced in which is found realized the greatest number of possibles. End of excerpt from On the Ultimate Origin of Things by Gottfried Leibniz 1646 to 1716